this court closed for the night. No thoroughfare. What are you looking at? Price on that jeweled mask. Be enough to feed a hundred squawking mouths for a year. Don't you go catching a conscience now. Worse than a suicide sentence. I can cut through the jewels to get around these gates. Okay, welcome to Game Spice. I'm Jessica, this is Kristen, and we're going to be playing Thief. But we're doing something slightly different this time. Um, Kristen is in the middle of working on her master's thesis. And she's been studying some really interesting material that she's been telling me about quite a lot. And as I was playing Thief the first time through, I couldn't help but notice that there was a lot of similarity. So I invited her to come while I played it through again. So hopefully you'll get the benefit of me doing things a little bit better. Um, and explain some of what she's working on for her thesis. It's really fascinating material. Um, you don't have to necessarily listen to us if you just want to see the gameplay. By all means, um, go ahead and mute it and watch just what I do. Uh, otherwise, though, this is going to be uh, relevant in fields like anthropology, psychology, uh, a variety of humanities fields. And, you know, give us a shot. This might be interesting. Um, basically, um, what I'm working on is I'm an ethics major or graduate student working in the field of ethics, and my focus is violence and what causes violence and why humans act in violent ways as a group. Um, so Jessica's right, this touches on cultural anthropology, it touches on ethnology, it touches on psychology, various humanities, religious studies, um, all these types of people and philosophers and scientists are interested in this. And um, the theory I'm going to present to you using Thief um, is um, the theory presented by a famous anthropological philosopher named Rene Girard. So if you think I'm full of it, or if you want to go read more about this, you could go look up Rene Girard. He is the preeminent thinker in this field. So it's really fascinating, and I hope that you keep listening, because who is not fascinated by violence, especially in the world that we live in and with all that we do? So um, to begin, I just want to explain one factor that you need to know before we dive in about ethics. In America, and in fact in most secular countries around the world, um, the prevailing ethic is called situational ethic, which is the concept that there are no universal truths, that there are just, um, that there's basically only interpretation. So there is no um, truth there is only interpretation. That, nothing is absolutely certain. Nothing is absolutely certain. Well, this is an alternate um, ethic, meaning um, the whole point of this theory is that there are absolutes, especially when we're dealing with human behavior and violence. And um, so I just want to, get, to put across that disclaimer that this might be very different than the way you've been brought up. This might be a different theory than what you've seen in college or um, in the workplace. Um, but it's fascinating and again, there's a lot of people in this school of thought um, writing about Rene Girard's concepts. There's a lot of people that disagree with it, but there's a whole lot of people that agree with it all across the scale from liberal to conservative to whatever. People are really fascinated by this. So, and when you're talking about absolutes, um, you, you're you talking about more than just, well, this is black and white, right and wrong. You're talking about even the most basic of absolute truths, that yeah. color is blue, the sun... The earth revolves around the yes. sun, that sort of thing, right. Um, there are people out there who actually will take it to everything is... Illusory. Okay. Right, you know, there are people who don't believe in absolute physical absolutes in science, like the earth revolves around the sun. They think that this whole physical world is an illusion. So you do not have to believe in absolutes, you can, but... Um, this particular theory is grounded in universals, and I just wanted to make sure we knew where we were starting from, because okay. this is not going to be normal okay. to us. which Or normal to at least most college educations. In which are grounded in situational ethics. Okay. So, um, when we hear the word ethics, we have a lot of different things that come into our minds um, because we fear violence on a personal level, yet we seek it out constantly in entertainment. We're fascinated with watching it, it and for a variety of reasons. We want justice and order, um, but these objectives are usually always linked with violence. And then we believe that religion causes violence. It's a cliche, but um, as you're going to see, especially if you stick with this episode in the next episode, what I'm going to reveal is that violence actually 
causes religion. That's such a strange concept. That sounds weird, but we're going to... Growing um, up, it's always been the other way around the Crusades. Mm-hmm. The terrorist attacks, the just... Witch hunts and so on. Yeah, very yeah. interesting. Um, and, and to do this, to delve in, we're going to be looking at a lot of uh, world uh, mythologies, as well as the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible, Um just because I am most familiar with these areas, but we'll also be looking at literature, um, you know, plays, poetry, all this stuff we're, we're going to delve in. Um, so, to start, I am going to list to you the last five commandments of the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, and you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything else that is in your neighbor's. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm using the Ten Commandments as an example here. You don't have to believe the Ten Commandments, but they make a great, exa- uh, great example because these first four laws are all acts, acts, per, you know, that you could, you could do to another person. Actions that can be performed. Right. Murder, uh, cheating, stealing, lying. But the last one is not an act. It's a motivation. Um, covet is an old-timey term for desire. This is dealing with the motive behind the action. Okay? Murdering, uh, cheating, stealing, lying, those are all motivated by desire. Um, so, what is this desire? Most of us, when we hear the word desire, we think of um, it just means you take pleasure in something. What's bad about that? Desire in and of itself is not bad. That's not what I'm saying. However, when you hear me talking about desire, I'm talking about desire in the negative sense of the term, as in unchecked selfish desire. And just to clarify even further, I'm going to give us a new term called mimetic desire because mimetic desire is the motivation behind every form of human violence and mimetic basically means mimetic is the greek word it comes from the greek uh, mimesis which essentially just means imitation mimicry mimicry okay so when i say the word imitation I'm talking about imitation in the good sense of learning, that which is part of our cognitive human development. When you hear me say the word mimetic, I'm talking about imitation in the bad sense of the word, just like I'm talking about desire in the bad sense of the word. So, mimetic desire means the desire that seeks to imitate another's desire for an object. So, let me give you a classic uh, example case study of this. You have a room full of toys, and you put two children in that room full of toys. One of those kids is going to find a toy first. What happens? Well, immediately the other kid's going to want it. Want that toy. You see that happen all the time. Even if there's a duplicate of that toy in the room. They want that. They want the toy that the other child has. This is fundamentally human, okay? We are very competitive, and we see each other as rivals, mimetic rivals. So... We, this is seen in keeping up with the Joneses. We want what our neighbors have. We want, we always think the grass is greener on the other side. Objects in and of themselves are not desirable on their own. They're only desirable when our friend has it or our enemy or our neighbor, whoever it is. Um, So we're going to give you um, a couple different examples of this because this is the fundamental cause of conflict. So mimetic desire, if, if left unchecked, can escalate into a rivalry. So like a sibling rivalry. But in this case, we're all siblings. Every human being in in our example is a sibling. We rival against each other to the point that it could become an obsession and that our rival over that object can become the object of our desire, which sounds really strange. It does. It does explain, though, stalkers who end up shooting the people that they stalk. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is kind of, you know, well, why would I actually want to be somebody else? Maybe I might want their car. Maybe I want their money. Maybe I want their house. But 
but this is mimetic Beyond. desire unchecked. So, so I'm going to give you an example from my home state of California um, that, you know, I grew up relatively close to Fresno, California, where um, about a decade ago there was um, a murder of a family. It was called, the, it, they were the Yule family. And what happened is a fairly wealthy father, his wife, and his daughter were slain, killed in their house on Easter Sunday. Um, the only survivor of the family was a son who had an airtight alibi with his girlfriend's family. His girlfriend's dad was a you know FBI agent. Um, and it took a year of grueling detective work for police to discover and, um, and um, build the case that this kid had basically paid a friend to off of his, off his parents. Why? Well, his dad had threatened to cut him off um, once he graduated school, that he would no longer be supporting his son. But what this really comes down to is a form of mimetic rivalry where your rival has become your object of desire because what friends from high school um, related when talking to the police was this guy was so obsessed with his father and with wanting to be his father that he would wear his dad's suits to school. He would wear his dad's Rolex watch. And his dad, who ran in a small, plain um, sales dealership and made quite a bit of money doing it, he would tell strangers that he ran a small airplane dealership. So you see, he wanted to become his father. He wanted to take his father's place. And that is where a mimetic rivalry can lead. It could lead to this escalation of violence, uh, this escalation, and it's contagious, and it spreads. And that's why you get, from a simple rivalry between two people, you end up with gangs and factions and clans, like the Hatfields and McCoys and Vendettas between mafias and, you know, then you have wars between nation. And this is all fundamentally coming from mimetic desire and rivalry. And there's another term I want to introduce before we're done with this episode, and that is the idea of doubles. The idea that when mimetic rivalry escalates to this point of obsession, the rivals begin to think and act alike, even though they think they are vastly different than the other person. These rivals appear like twins or doubles to people watching from the outside because they are acting so much alike that they look so much alike. But they don't see it that way. But they, they don't see it that way. they're the exact opposite. Exactly. So, um, again, this is kind of, we see this in literature. We see this in plays. I mean, you have in Shakespeare's King Lear, you have the two daughters constantly fighting over the father whom he thinks that they love him but really they're just rivaling between each other um, over power and prestige or um, you see this in movies over and over again I mean you see this constantly this rivaling between people um, that is at its heart based on desiring something that the other person has whether it is um, their spouse, their girlfriend, their um, clothing, their car, whatever it may be, this leads to the acts of violence against the other person, which is stealing, which is, you know, lying, cheating, and murder. It's interesting because in and of itself, wanting a nice car, even a car like the one that your neighbor has, is not getting to the point of mimetic desire. It's not wrong to say that you have you want something or you have a goal. Mm -hmm. It only becomes a problem when it starts being unbalanced, when you start to make that more a part of your life than your actual life. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of when things start to get a little bit weird. And it's so easy for us to, you know, when we are shocked by violence on the news or wherever, or we, we hear of a family like the Yule family where the son kills everybody and we're just shocked and we're like, how could this have happened? Well, it happens a little at a time and you don't even know it's happening. You, you know? only see the difference between a gap of a lot of years. Mm -hmm. So um, that's all I really want to, to do for our introduction, but I hope you stick with us till the next episode where we get to talk about the crises and anarchy and complete destruction and chaos <laughs> and how that relates to Thief. So. Hopefully you will stick with us. Um, I'm going to just keep on 
playing here, you'll probably see some of the side quests come up soon. There won't be a commentary with those, but if you're interested in how they're done and maybe seeing me going in circles a couple of times, that might be interesting. I hope you enjoyed uh, our talk today, or even if you just enjoyed the gameplay, thank you for joining us. Um, please join us next time.